Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, panelists. Welcome, future virtual observers, virtual audience. I'm so happy to be with all of you today across oceans discussing the work of the Clichettes. I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Ivana Dizdar. I'm the curator of the Clichettes, Lips, Wigs, and Politics on view until November 22nd at the McMaster Museum of Art. And we are so lucky to have with us today all three clichettes, as well as a couple respondents who will respond to and discuss their work, um, their work in general and their work at the exhibition. So the way that this panel will work is we'll start with some remarks by the respondents, then we'll get into questions and discussion, and then maybe we'll have some chance for more, more comments. We'll see how things go. We're going to try to keep this at around an hour. But I will begin first with introducing everyone. So we have so, so lucky to have all three clichettes with us today. Maybe when I say your name, you can do some kind of <laughs> signal, a dance or a piece of choreography from one of the clichettes works. We have with us Louise Garfield. Louise has had a multitude of careers as a performer, choreographer, film producer, and community arts administrator. She also has had a very successful run as a feminist clown at the Organ Grinder in Toronto. Welcome, okay. Louise. <laughs> Janice Hladke is grateful for the opportunities she's enjoyed to develop a history of feminist collaborative creative work in performance art, theater, dance, and choreography, video and curatorial practice in all that history's intensity, zaniness, and fun. Her artistic work and her academic research and publications share a commitment to investigating how bodies are theorized, materialized, regulated, regulated and politicized. Welcome, Janice. Thank you for being with us. And I'm just, it's 38 degrees where I'm right now, so I'm, I'm just going to turn up the fan that's blowing on me. Please tell me if you can hear it and if it's distracting. Johanna Householder still enjoys working at the intersection of popular and unpopular culture. She has just returned from a residency in Saskatoon, collaborating with BC artist Judith Price and sound artist W.L. Altman on exploiting the Zoom platform as a low-tech recording studio and as a digital territory in which to inhabit the glitch. At various points, the glitch represents the discontinuity between what we humans know about the end of the world and each other and what we're willing to do about it. She is the devoted partner of Angelo and the proud mother of Carmen, both of whom she has collaborated with in the past. Thank you, Johanna, for joining us. Uh, so those are the three clichettes that I've just introduced. And now I'm about to introduce two additional people who have generously joined us today to respond to the clichettes work. Really happy to have here uh, John Grayson. John, hello. John wins best fashion, best costume for this panel. John is a Toronto video slash film artist whose works include Photo Booth 2022, Fig Trees 2009, Lilies 1996, and Zero Patience 1993. And finally, Cyrus Marcus Ware is a Vanier scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus is an assistant professor at the School of the Arts, McMaster University. Using drawing, installation, and performance, Cyrus works with and explores social justice frameworks and Black activist culture. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you all. So let's begin with some remarks. We'll start with John. We'll move on to Cyrus. I know both of them have a ton to say about the relationship of art and politics, about lip sync and drag and activism and humor and collaboration. Um, so much to say about the clichettes. This I've always found is, has been a struggle for me as a curator working on the show and writing about the show. There's always a million things to say and the, the struggle is really figuring out what to say. So let's see how John and, and Cyrus have dealt with this challenge. Please take it away, John. Thank you, Ivana. And delighted, honored to be here as part of this conversation. Driving down to Hamilton to see your retrospective in June clichettes. I have to confess, I was nervous. The reason was clear. It's because time-based work in general and performance art in particular are notoriously difficult to contain within the 
straitjacket confines of a museum, to say nothing of the daunting task of trying to pay adequate tribute to four decades of extraordinary work. More for the clichets, your chosen idiom of lip sync brings with it special challenges because of the tension between the live and the pre recorded, the lips and body occupying someone else's words. How could your museum exhibition with no live element possible rise to this challenge? I'm delighted to report that I was emphatically gobsmacked, my favorite lip affiliated term, by how brilliantly lips, wigs, and politics surprised and challenged and delighted and intrigued our road trip crew. Here are some of the deft and elegant choices that resonated for me in particular. The stunning overall design of the show, reminding me of Eaton's window displays in London, Ontario, circa 1965, providing mod stages for your four featured plays. The saucy subversion of the period mannequins with their demure closed eyes, flaunting their go to hell Velcro junk. The well-chosen clip reel that was live in the space in dialogue with the screens where we could watch each play in full. The curatorial coincidence of being in such marvelous dialogue with the shows of Laurie Blondeau and Kira Bolt. The beautifully curated vitrines that captured so much extraordinary history, including a personal favorite, a thank you note from Tim McCaskill for appearing at the Body Politic Free the Press Rally. For me, the show walks a perfect tightrope, capturing the vast anarchic delights of your work while bringing a rigorous disciplined focus to each curatorial choice, equally inviting longtime fans and first timers into a truly meaningful dialogue with the clichets and your radical feminist project. My experience of LIPS brought back a flood of personal memories, reminding me of the massive debt my own work owes to your work over these many decades. Louise performing as Russian revolutionary Alexandra Kollontai in my Moscow Does Not Believe in Queers. Johanna curating my You Taste American into a CAMH performance series called Thousand and One Nights. Being on set with Janice when she created the character of Rosa Cosa in Colin Campbell's Fiddle Faddle. And most of all, the clichets themselves appearing as bickering pathogens in the bloodstream of poor old patient Zero, in Zero Patients, a musical which Louise co-produced and which was truly only possible because of your fractious fusion of humor, camp, rage, and chutzpah it, that got there first and emboldened and inspired so many of us to likewise follow suit. So I'm honored and delighted to have this live and pre-recorded opportunity to say a heartfelt- Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think I speak for all of us when I say, really just these are beautiful remarks so touching um we're all blushing and um also <laughs> shameless plug if you like the way that john speaks and writes which of course you do um you should come to the official opening of the show which is also a book launch for the catalog for the clichets lips and wigs lips wigs and politics john is one of eight contributors who has um written for this i if i may say so myself beautiful fully illustrated catalog containing texts and images from throughout the clichets over and it's it's going to be really gorgeous and, and such a fun and beautiful testament to the spirits of the clichets so thank you john for being here thank you for your remarks thank you for your your text for the book uh cyrus we'd love to hear your remarks too and then we'll we'll move on to questions Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here uh, today talking about the clichets. It's so wonderful to be here with all of you. And thank you, John, for your remarks. I mean, 40 years of work 
uh, you know, just such an incredible uh, moment. I'm struck by uh, this exhibition. I'm struck by uh, the way that we get to engage with the work, perhaps in a different context mm -hmm. than it was originally produced. Uh, and I love that we're getting to sort of sit with the work uh, in that durational way. As an emerging performance artist in the late 90s, uh, studying with Colin Campbell, David Buller, and Susan Schell, I remember uh, learning about the Clichettes and being completely um, blown away by, enraptured would maybe be the better word, uh, by this way of bringing dance, performance, and performance art together uh, using humor. Uh, I'm somebody who has always loved a satirical approach, who's always appreciated the ways that change making can happen through shared laughter, through shared connection, uh, and maybe poking fun a bit at the status quo. Uh, and so when I uh, found out about the Pichettes, it, it totally set me on a different trajectory in my own creative practice. So to be able to come uh, to the McMaster Museum of Art and to be able to see uh, an exhibition that really does such beautiful justice to this incredible legacy of work, uh, you know, was 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 quite profound. It reminded me of these moments uh, in the 90s, um, studying and learning about what was possible. Um, as somebody who went into theater, I'm also really uh, captivated by this move between dance and moving into more theatrical works uh, in the later part of your career. And uh, yeah, so this movement between uh, dance and choreography as a main medium into more, more and more theatrical works is something that is mirrored in my own practice, moving from performance art into more theatrical spaces. And I'm really, um, I'm just captivated by this. I think about the ways that we come together in social dance uh, moments and how often there was a sort of spark of art-based activism that was coming together in these moments when we were already gathering. Um, and I just love that we're now getting to see this in a museum context. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That's my favorite prayer. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Cyrus. Thank you so much for your beautiful commentary and you're touching on so many things that I think we're really going to delve into today. Um, one thing that really strikes me is that you are you remember the first time that you encountered the police sets. And oh, am I breaking up now? No, it's okay. Uh, I interviewed 30 plus people as I was working on this exhibition and everyone seems to remember the very first time that they saw the clichettes, whether it was live or in video format. And I'm definitely one of those people. I was um, in my very early 20s in a performance art seminar with Lisa Steele and Kim Tomczak. And I remember it truly like it was yesterday. I remember the surroundings in the room. I remember who I was sitting next to. I remember all, what I was wearing. Like it was just, it was such an important moment to, for me. And I think the reason everyone remembers is because you can't experience the cliches and feel the same way that you feel that you felt before. It's like before and after Christ. It's like before and after the cliches. Um, what were you wearing, Ivana? <laughs> I was wearing, I, I'm pretty sure I was wearing my favorite pink t-shirt, which <laughs> feels, which feels appropriate. Um, so with, without further ado, um, Let's take it away with the questions. Um, we'll start with John and um, some of his thoughts about the power of lip sync and what it means to use. All right, thanks. In 2024, we seem to find ourselves in the midst of a lip sync re renaissance with urgent avant-garde activist works of theater like Dana H or documentaries, new documentaries like any other way, the Jackie Shane story, or social media, TikTok Intifada, or performance comedy, like Sarah Cooper destroying Donald Trump, all deploying lip sync today in innovative ways. So I have to ask you, Clichettes, is this all your fault? Yes. I mean, no. <laughs> What I mean to say is that we'd love to take credit for all the lip sync brilliance and innovation that preceded and followed us. And I'm sure I speak to for everyone um, to thank you, John, for the totally fascinating lip sync history and analysis that you've written for the catalog. 
Uh, you're going to have to update believe it. Believe me, fun was had. <laughs> you're going to have to update it annually or uh, make a documentary. Yeah, yeah. That's my advice to you. Anyway, what I wanted to zero in on um, was, was um, Sarah Cooper. We were all um, very, very big fans of Sarah Cooper. Um, and the way she manipulated lip sync into a really powerful political takedown. She was the complete opposite of us. She was lip sync unplugged. No wigs, no costumes, no makeup, just her very skilled lip sync juxtaposed with her unadorned self, which bore no resemblance to Donald Trump. And she used the, the fact of that difference to reveal and to magnify the words and the physicality and the character of the man. It was truly fascinating <laughs> to watch how discordant it was and how powerful um, it was as a message. It was brilliant. Uh, we've also fooled around um, with spoken word a little bit. Um, the 2000 year old man comes to mind, um, Elaine May and Mike Nichols uh, as examples, but, um, and a couple of pieces in our, in uh, She Devils of Niagara, one that Janice performed and one that I performed. Um, but just to let you know, <laughs> lip sync to spoken word is a much greater challenge, much, much harder <laughs> than music, than lip syncing to music. Um, and unlike Sarah Cooper, uh, when we did this, we used exaggerated visuals um, to amp up the vocal characters and the feminist critique that we were pursuing. And just to finish off, I want to tell you about a lip sync project that we had that never made the light of day. We, um, we worked for quite a while on being dinosaurs on a tightrope while lip syncing the Bee Gees staying alive. But since we were not willing <laughs> to get on a real tightrope <laughs> and we really couldn't figure out how to stage a fake tightrope, uh, this remains an unfulfilled goal. <laughs> John, if you can help us out with that, I bet I, you can. I have uh, two words for you, green screen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for that really rich response. And I, I actually had no idea about this state unfaded what's the word I'm looking for this performance that never happened um goes to show that even as the curator working on this exhibition and working with these three wonderful women for four years I still don't know everything and every time we talk I learn new things so we'll have to figure out a way to make this performance happen with John as director with a green screen um and it there sounds like it would others too there were many others that didn't see the light of the day. we will have to make a list and a new publication. Um, so it sounds like this would have been an extremely comedic performance, which I think leads nicely into Cyrus's question regarding humor and and comedy um, and how these are um, used and potentially misused in contemporary culture. Yeah, I mean, you have me at dinosaurs on a tightrope <laughs> dancing to staying alive like you have me you know so I'm so um I'm so captivated by and, and so curious about your approach of of humor um and, and I'm wondering if you could just because of course we we know the context in 2024 uh for you know understanding and thinking through the the humorous moments in this exhibition what was the landscape and context for your humorous and satirical approach in your first few years what drew you to humor and I'm, I am curious if you were making a new work today, maybe for this exhibition, if you were to make a new work, what funny thing would you want to do? And I'm gonna answer that question, Cyrus, thanks. Uh, and I'll 
got a few little notes, but what immediately comes to mind are two different kinds of contexts. One is around comedy, but the other is around the politics. And so we were very caught up in feminist thought and feminist activism uh, in terms of the kind of work that we were doing in those arenas, we were all three members of the Women's Cultural Building, for example, which was not a building and was deliberately named as a building because of the idea of building culture and building uh, an address to forms of oppression, whether that was around gender or sexuality uh, and race. So that was one context or landscape for us, uh, I like that word. And another one was we were often involved, I mean, I can't remember how many marches we were on, but as an example, uh, International Women's Day and the kind of uh, events and actions that were a part of that. And then finally, and this is something that Ivana has foregrounded so wonderfully in the exhibition, is our commitment to work at benefits, performance at benefits, and there are many, and sharing the stage with really phenomenal artists. Lillian Allen would be one example. Um, benefits, Lesbian and Gay Pride Day, and uh, Nicaraguan Health Workers Association. So that political landscape uh, is really significant. To turn though, um, as a second thought, is the comedic landscape. And it's interesting, Saras, that you were bringing up about movement and choreography, because I think our both our training and our creation in movement expression and choreography has naturally led to the kind of lip sync work that we do so that the satire is embedded in the body and the entire body and in specifically as well in facial expression and that the complication of that. So I think we've been quite committed um, to that embodied comedy. And of course, uh, just immediately coming to mind from the past, the fabulous physical comedy of somebody like Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett. And one of the things that I think is so um, instructive maybe about their physical comedy is its fearlessness. So the clichettes were never afraid to be embarrassed or embarrassing in their work. And I think that's kind of an important piece of the comedic element. Um, let's see, I made a few notes here. What else did I wanna say? Um, uh, yeah, I did want to mention, you know, we, we, in the catalog, we refer to fellow travelers and uh, the Hummer sisters and Sheila Gostick, just to give two examples of fellow travelers in the comedic vein. And again, I would say that their work too, very political, uh, fearless, and, um, you know, sharing that moment that landscape and that context with them and others I think was was really important. Uh, in terms of what drew us to humor, uh, I think that there's humor always or comedy always has the potential to be piercing. Uh, it has the potential to be subversive, uh, interruptive, disruptive. And in terms of the history of comedy and thinking back to the Greeks, uh, it was thought of as a corrective. Comedy was always thought of as a corrective to social and cultural norms. And I think those are the elements that drew us to comedy that were really important. Um, and I love that, um, well, actually a colleague of, of yours at Mac, um, Chris Meyer, who is a great artist, local artist. And uh, one of the great things that Chris said is how much he loved going into this exhibition, how Ivana worked with our work to draw an audience reaction of laughter. And at the same time, you know, your laughter is then caught into the seriousness of it. I really appreciated Chris's attention to that. And I have one other thing I just wanna, because this just came up yesterday, I was reading an article 
about um, an activist, I think Serbian, in fact, uh, she talks about laughatism. And laugh at I thought it was really a great word, a word I'd never heard of before, but this activist idea about using laughter to pierce authoritarianism. I just love that. Um, an approach in 2024, you brought up, uh, John, I think about the longevity or Cyrus, perhaps it was you, I'm forgetting now. And um, to think about comedy, again, to reference a Greek idea, uh, the connection to the word revel. And I would like to think about us in 2024, reveling in this incredible longevity, this long-term collaboration um, for, I think I counted 46 years. <laughs> it's just pretty remarkable. Um, I'd like to revel in the privilege of doing creative work. Uh, not everybody gets to do it and to have a forum for it. And so very appreciative of that. Um, one other thing, a friend of mine just went to a concert in Vancouver of Tim Minchin. I don't know if people know the work of Tim Minchin, uh, who does, who, he's a composer, a musician, um, theater artist, uh, performing artist, uh, does a lot of comedy, and he's referring to some of his shows as the unfunny shows. And in fact, his shows are very funny, but the whole idea of unfunniness to talk about humor, I thought was brilliant. So I'd like to think of us in 2024 as doing the unfunny work, which is funny work. Thank you so much, Janice, for offering so much food for thoughts and so many avenues. And um, <laughs> yeah, just to add, I mean, one of the things perhaps obvious, but really the most important and my favorite about the Clichette's work is that they really seduce you with humor as well as other ways, whether aesthetics, their wigs, the songs, all this stuff, but really the humor draws you in. And then once you're there, you realize you're actually looking at something really serious, really political, really contemporary and, and radical. And, and then you're kind of caught in this push and pull between wanting to laugh and in some cases even wanting to cry. And I find that super, super uh, powerful. And I think, I think humor definitely, you know, you touched on it, Jan, um, a couple times was having a moment in the 80s and the early 90s in Toronto. And I, I know John has a great follow-up question about that context, about that landscape. What was going on? What were the conversations? John, do you want to ask your next question? For sure. And Jen, I'll, I will say 46 more years, but right now we're going to wind back to right at the beginning, 46 years ago, in our tiny Queen West community, which really was only a few blocks. And you, of course, the three of you were at the very center of it, waitressing at the Parrot, at the Parrot restaurant. But you were surrounded just in a few blocks by organizations like Body Politic and A, a Space came later, I think, or was about to, about to move in, Art Metropole. That tiny Queen West community was, was really um, the, the, the place where you were in dialogue with a new generation of artists. So in some ways it's echoing, continuing what Cyrus has already and Dan have already begun about touchstones and triggers in terms of influence, collaboration, reaction. What was what was helping shape the, the work then right at the beginning? Okay, so it's my turn to answer this question. And unlike everyone else, I've made zero notes, although I just made one because I thought, oh, I know what's coming. Um, Toronto in the 80s was like Paris in the 20s. You go back and you find out that it was actually only like four or five people in Paris in the 20s that made Paris in the 20s or, or Harlem in the 30s. So um, it was a very small but just incredibly... Uh, luscious, vibrant scene, and you were a huge part of it. But the first person that really comes to mind for me as being a kind of um, a person that things coalesced around was Colin Campbell. And I think that Colin's work, and we all, you know, individually and collectively worked with Colin and with you. Um, 
and his own um, complete, often deadpan, um, you know, uh, make you laugh, cry humor, um, but really acerbic social commentary uh, was so inspirational to me personally, and I think to all of us. Um, and also he was such a magnet, you know, of bringing people and ideas together. So, so I really want to acknowledge Colin, Colin at this moment. Um, and of course, uh, Lillian and Clifton, Lillian, who we were, are incredibly lucky, also wrote for the catalog, Lillian Allen, um, Toronto's poet laureate at the moment. So, you know, from, from the Cameron house to I forget what we call uh, Nathan Phillips Square. Do we call it something fancy? I don't know. Anyway, City Hall, whatever. Uh, Lillian and Clifton. Uh, and then I was thinking about the musicians, um, you know, people like Moja and Aaron Davis and Molly, Molly and Tabby Johnson and Big Sugar. Um, uh, Janice has mentioned the Hummer sisters, of course, who were also... Uh, funny political commentary, ran for mayor, um, but also had a band uh, that included Andy Patterson and Robert Stewart. Um, uh, and then the theater scene <clears throat> as well was was really, you know, pumping with um, local creators, right? People were not performing the Greeks or or uh, Eugene O'Neill or whatever, like everybody was reinventing theater, including someone who we worked with, uh, Harant Alianak, who invented this incredible, um, really choreographed theater, which used, you know, pumping rock music to to drown out the dialogue. <laughs> and um, Harant later uh, came in when we needed a director and directed our, our uh, second production of Half Human, Half Heartache. And the thing I remember most about him and that I've always treasured and always <clears throat> keep in the back of my mind as a theater director was he would sit in the, in the house watching us and go <laughs> faster. <laughs> and that's really important when it comes to comedy. You've got to be, you got to, get in there with the with the uh, shiv and uh, get out quick. He had so, a metronome. He had a metronome. He was a metronome. He was a force. Um, Paul Bettis, Theater Second Floor, Theater Pass Marai produced our first show. You know, the, the theater community was super receptive at that point. But we also were pretty uncomfortable with the hierarchy of theater, as we were with the hierarchies that were implicit in dance. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily a super comfortable place for us to be. And I think we bristled against a lot of the hierarchies and restrictions that we had um, in theater. Nevertheless, uh, you know, it did uh, provide us with the platform and um, and we didn't have to haul our own equipment, which of course we did have to do when we first started, <clears throat> which is um, grueling. Um, who else do I wanna mention that hasn't been mentioned? The artists, right? The chromosome people, uh, Andy, Fabo, uh, Sybil Goldstein, Ray Johnson, John Scott, all Vera Frankel, all uh, very important and I think inspirational to all of us. And um, yeah, somebody will have to go back and write the whole, well, I think a few people have tried, uh, the whole book of Toronto in the 80s because it really is uh, and was like Paris in the 20s. And if I could travel back in time, I would, I would love that. I know where I would go. I would actually go to the first performance of you guys doing go to hell and ripping your penises off and kissing them. No, no, those are two different things, go. Ivana. <laughs> go to, oh, oh, go to hell. Yes. Okay. Well, that was the women's, that was the five minute feminist cabaret. Um, and I always loved what uh, Mark Tarnecki wrote about that moment, which was, it was like biting into a 10,000 volt wire. 
and we're going like we did it <laughs> it's perfection perfect moment in art history um thank you johanna thank you so much for that beautiful response and for painting such a fantastic picture of, of the toronto context and what it was like to to be in it to be working in it to be collaborating with others seeing others perform and, and make all kinds of art um, i know cyrus and, and all of us I are also interested have, in what i it was should like. have mentioned just i should have mentioned the restaurateurs yeah. as well like the food culture that sustained us all, you know, mm -hmm. Greg and Alan, Sandy Stagg, uh, uh, Andrew Milne Allen, yep. um, you know. Places like the Rivoli and Queen Mother. It's hard, I think, for uh, my generation now to really understand how important the restaurant and cafe scene was in Toronto and for arts and mm -hmm. in, in this period, how the, these um, they were art and restaurants were really flowing into each other and there wasn't such a hard distinction between these two areas of activity and it's still hard for me to imagine um, another reason I would love to go back. Um, yeah. So Cyrus, um, please take it away with your your next question. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in your collaborative work, the way that you have worked together, um, the way that uh, your collaborative practice um, created these worlds for all of us. And I'm wondering what the impact or what you all feel, because like, I mean, you're also, you know, artists who have done, um, you know, other other work outside of the Clichettes. And I'm just curious, what would you say is the lasting impact of the Clichettes on the way that you work, your ways of working and what you create today? Well, um... <laughs> I'd say um, I wanted to talk about um, collaborative work and what what I learned about it from the clichés and taking it forward into a number of different areas, first into film and television and then into um, community arts um, administration that I uh, was involved with. Janice and Johanna have different trajectories after um, after we stopped performing, both into universities, and you know, I, uh, I, I can, I'll speak to what uh, I know about in terms of that. I know that uh, from our collaboration that to be successful, you need um, a lot of time. It's it's slower than uh, other types of. Uh, ways of working. You need the time to be able to do the long listening process and to have extended conversations uh, in order to get a satisfactory consensus, which may not mean 100% agreement from all the partners. So the slower you can go, and the smaller you can go, we were fortunate because we were um, a small uh, group over a long period of time. So we had the advantage of being small and having lots of time. And um, when I was talking about not having 100% um, agreement from all the partners, that's important because um, I think too much compromise can lead to kind of wishy-washy um, artistic decisions and outcomes. And so when I went into a different um, type of work, it wasn't small and it didn't have the amount of time. And so going, going solo, or working top down um, can be easier and faster, but it's lonelier, and it and it doesn't allow for the um, uh, multiplication of ideas and the uh, strengths that you get uh, and that you uh, learn about from other trusted partners. So. To try to replicate that, I, mean, I tried to replicate it as much as I could, um, but 
the great thing about it is that it's full of surprises. It's full of um, <clears throat> learning because you learn about someone's different perspective on the same thing or their different kinds of knowledge that they have, different kinds of skills that they have. Um, so that's a real gift that you get from working um, collaboratively that you could never do um, on your own. And it's much more fun uh, when it's good. When you're on the same wavelength, it's much more fun. And getting to, um, you know, if you can stay on the wavelength, then it's really fun. <laughs> and we, I have to say, compliment to both my partners, it has sustained over all these many, many years. Um, so that's that's the great thing. Um, one of the things, you know, that John and I worked together on, his for, on our first feature film, and film is a very hierarchical structure. And we tried to bring from our feminist um, um, backgrounds, you know, the the um, the practice of consciousness raising in the early late 60s and, and 70s, constructive criticism. Um, those were important uh, parts of the feminist movement that we tried to bring into artistic practice. But as I say, on film, in theater, um, in television, where, uh, where I worked a little bit, it's very hierarchical. So to bust that open is, is tricky, especially when there's limited time and limited resources. We know that really well. So one of the things that recently impressed me was um, <clears throat> the way in which Sarah Pauly uh, talked about working on women, women talking, um, where um, she, she changed the culture of the film set and I, I was really admiring of her um, to be able to, to do that. Um, so that's my Thank thought. You, <laughs> Those you. are my thoughts. I'm, I'm really I'm struck by what you said about uh, working collaboratively and working from the ground up, how it's a lot more fun. And that fun, it's in the context of the experience, I'm sure, of working on the play, the performance, whatever it is, but it also really, um, it shows, you know, it's something that audiences can see, it's something audiences can feel, and it resonates in the content of the work. Like I'm thinking how it allows you to make work that's a lot more weird. And I use the word weird in the best possible sense. Um, and I think that thought actually do dovetails really well with uh, John's next question creating weird characters, weird work, weird performances. Thank you. Here are two weird questions about rage. In 1989's Out for Blood, the clichets created a portrait of three so-called monstrous women, besmirched, betrayed, and beheaded, hiding out in a matinee of Bonnie and Clyde while they lament the monstrous world they find themselves in. Medusa wails to her sisters, don't you want justice? If there had been any justice in my time, my head would never have been severed from my body, my rage from my purpose. I want my rage back intact. So in this utterly monstrous Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, Trump climate crisis moment, number one, what would Medusa, the Weather Underground's Bernadine Dorn and Bad Seed Patty be raging about today in 2024? And number two, what movie would they be lip syncing to? <laughs> I, um, I'm going to go at that one, John. And to the first question, I'll say a two word answer basically everything <laughs> they would be raging about. Uh, perhaps your hat, <laughs> but uh, to be more specific, I mean, there's so many, uh, you know, uh, the rise of the right, ableism, uh, ageism, as we get older, it's uh, often an unaddressed oppression. Um, transphobia, et cetera, you know, uh, ongoing gender and sexuality challenges. When I think about, if I try to think about having uh, 
discussions about humor in this as well. I'm thinking of a show that is um, called The Furious Forest. And it's a show about climate change. And um, Johanna plays, it's so that in the forest, Johanna plays a mushroom and Louise is a tree and I'm the moss. And we also um, play different kinds of uh, disasters. So um, we would, one of us would be a fire, another would be a flood, and somebody else would be a tornado or a hurricane or something like that. So the rage around uh, the future of the planet, that would be our, our take on it and with some bit of humor as well. Um, but yeah, tons to rage about. Interesting that you brought up about um, the, the quote from Out for Blood about justice, because I was thinking about uh, rage in relation to uh, a future, thinking about the past, the present, and the future, and the significance of hope in relation to rage. So to be a little bit academic for a moment, I always really loved the work of Roger I. Simon, uh, who wrote about the politics of hope. And his idea about hope was nothing to do with any kind of utopian idea. It was always about accountability and responsibility. So I think rage has to be accompanied by a sense of, uh, of uh, accountability. Um, and so that there's a sense of commitment to others. So it's not just wild raging for nothing, but there's a raging that has uh, an idea of, uh, as I said, commitment to others and a sense of uh, what needs to be addressed in order to think about a different and a better world. So that feels to me really important. Um, the second question about films, these are not films that I thought of as lip syncing, but these are films that I thought of that we would be watching. There would have to be three. Um, for Bernadine, uh, and you mentioned Monstrous Women. So for Bernadine, I think it would be the animated film Monstrous Inc. Because those furry creatures actually win against capitalism. So Bernadine would love that and we would watch that together. And then for Medusa, she would have to have a film that is um, snake positive, uh, snake power. And so I think it might be snakes on a plane uh, where we would be watching the snakes taking over, taking over everything. Um, for Patty, there's no way Patty would be what we wouldn't be watching a film. Patty would have already made a film. <laughs> Patty would have made a film with girls ruling the world. And so we would be watching Patty's film, but Patty's film would be, you know, everywhere, screened everywhere in the world. It would be a huge hit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. Uh, love. I I'm going to rewatch the first two movies now and, and want Patty's movie to be made so I can watch it. Um, well, we're talking about the present. We're talking about the way that the cliches work resonates in the present and the kind of things that you're thinking about now. Um, I know Cyrus is also curious about the future. Cyrus, what, what's your next question? Yeah, I'm very curious about the future. I'm very interested in the future. But I'm also very interested in watching Snakes on the Plane with Medusa. Like that would be a really great way to play. <laughs> so for that um, So let's just imagine forward. I mean, I think John, you said earlier, 46 more years and I'm uh, on that team. Um, but let's imagine forward to the year 2047. So 70 years after you began this work, it's 2047 and I'll just set the scene. We've somehow survived the worst of the climate crisis and other apocalyptic moments. We're living longer and we have more time to make art. What a glorious future. The clichettes are invited back together for a one day only performance or artwork experience. What would you wanna to make together? Where do you think we're headed and where do you think we'll be in 2047 in the scope of your work, 70 years after you started? So if you could dream into the future with me, I would love that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, 
I did think about this one and I think, uh, you know, we'll be getting well into our 90s. Uh, will be practically translucent by then. So the audience will have to have their opacity dials so they can even see us, right? They're going to have to turn their opacity dials up to 11. Uh, <clears throat> but we will be um, finally getting the opportunity because we've been understudying um, Meryl, Isabella, and Goldie Hawn in the Broadway remount of Death Becomes Her. And we've been sitting backstage in our, in our motorized hovercrafts, uh, waiting for the opportunity to uh, zoom on in our choreographed um, uh, electric um, uh, vehicles. Uh, <clears throat> but all of this is taking place at Rideau Hall uh, because, in fact, we, you know, there's too much focus on the, on the part of the um, continent that gets in the way of us being easily able to go to Mexico directly. So uh, we're just decided to ignore uh, between the 49th and the, you know, uh, whatever seventh I don't 11th parallel I don't know what that the Rio Grande okay so we're just ignoring that part we've stitched together uh Mexico and um and uh Canada and uh <clears throat> and the new uh prime minister of course the uh conjoined twins uh who are ruling the country um uh with Patty as um senior advisor, I think. Uh, of course, Pat, as we all know, Patty's film turned out to be a remake of The Village of the Damned, uh, where the children, you know, explode everyone with their eyeballs. But uh, that's, um, that's my vision of where we'll be. Um, and I do also, besides the fact that we have kind of stitched together Mexico and Canada, want to mention or return to the idea of humor because the Malahats, the Malahats make America laugh again instead of MAGA. Uh, so yeah, I just, yeah, the Malahats, that's, yeah, uh, that's, we'll be wearing them. I want to be there with you right now, waiting in the wings, about to see your hovercrafts go on the stage with my Mala hat on again. I, I, I can't wait. Okay, dial up that opacity dial because we're, we're beginning to, to evaporate. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, for that. Um, does anyone have any question, a question that has come up, anyone for anyone? Clichettes, do you have any questions for John or Cyrus? Oh. oh. I mean, so we can totally end on what Johanna just said. That would be a perfect ending to this panel, so. Would be a perfect it, I think that we should just end it there. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Cyrus. Louise. Thank you, John. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Ivana. It was so much fun talking to you and um, seeing you. And I will see you all very soon at the opening, which again for our audience is on September 19th, I believe from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. There will be food and drinks and a new freshly printed catalog. Um, and we're gonna party really hard. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Really such a pleasure and honor. Such a joyous. <laughs>